Tomb of Annihilation, a new board game based on the same system that we saw in Castle Ravenloft, uh, Wrath of a Shardalon, Legend of Drizzt, so another D&D board game. And the system is really an exactly the same. Um, Gameplay-wise, this, uh, this set plays like the previous ones. It is a shared core of rules so that has been very stable over the years. And then each set uh, gives us different characters, uh, setting, objectives, monsters, and pretty much gives us the tools, the avatars, to create a different story around that, that system. I picked up this game at Django in 2017 as soon as I saw it, no hesitation, uh, because I'm a big fan of the, of, this, of the system. I enjoyed all of the previous games, some more, some less, but they were all really fun to play, so I was very excited to discover that there was another, another chapter. Uh, in the game. In Tomb of Annihilation, one to five players will control a group of fantasy heroes in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, and these heroes are traveling in some really disturbing, dark, uh, scary uh, jungle, very unfriendly. It's one of, not one of those friendly jungles, it's one of the unfriendly ones. Traveling in the jungle, uh, talking to people, killing monsters, and pretty much performing quests in order to gain clues that will allow them um, to tackle the, the, the big problem of the campaign, which is there's this death curse that is plaguing the land, and again, the heroes are performing these quests, uh, these adventures, to be able to um, get to figure out where they need to go and what they need to do to stop the plague. So, there's a little bit of this pick up and delivery here. In a scenario, in order to do something, you need to grab something or, or pick up and murder instead of pick up and delivery. You need to go and defeat a certain monster, etc, etc. Um, although there is a certain level of redundancy in the, in the scenarios, still, when you play them in order, you see an overarching story that emerges. Also, thanks to another element that is in this set and not in previous ones, which you will see uh, later in my video when I show you the, the terrain tiles. Anyways, let's talk about Tomb of Annihilation. Yes, new characters, monsters and terrain, a new storyline, but let's see more in detail what you find in this box. Since miniatures are an important element of this game and definitely a big draw for many players, let's start by having a closer look at some of the miniatures that come in the game. These five miniatures that you see here are the heroes that the players will control. Several of them are non-human. Here we have a bard. Here we have a Saurian paladin, which as far as I can remember is a new thing. And in the previous the previous games, as far as I can remember, most people were human or humanoid, you know, like, like dwarves. These anthropomorphic animals were not a distinctive feature. Here in the back we have the villains. The color is almost the same as that of the heroes. And we have just, you know, some big animals, big birdy type of beasts here, a very grumpy gorilla. A four-armed gargoyle for when two arms would not be enough. The most impressive piece in the set and in all of the board Dungeons and Dragons board games that I've seen, the Juggernaut, which is the sort of like big gigantic vehicle apparently made of rock, full of covered with runes, and the level of detail is just very impressive. And just, of course, the size on the board makes it impressive in itself. And then we have uh, the villains here. No spoilers, but I want at least to show you the level of detail, the level of detail of this miniature, which is absolutely impressive. Especially for a person like me who does not paint miniatures. I have these evocative and very good looking miniatures, even without having to paint them. And then here in the foreground we see these green miniatures that represent the minions, the run-of-the-mill monsters, the unwashed masses of the monsters, those that you will encounter during the adventure and that you will have to deal with usually before you get to the to the villain. The theme as you can see is like undead and, and beasts, animals, jungle animals. In fact most of the adventures uh, in the scenario book do take place in the jungle. So here's an overlook of the miniatures, here is a general look at all the miniatures that you get with the set. 
And now, let's talk about gameplay. If you played other Dungeons and Dragons board games in the past, such as Castle Ravenloft, Riff of Shardlon, and Temple of Elemental Evil, you know how to play this game. Gameplay is virtually indistinguishable. It's really very similar, which is great. You don't have to spend much time learning the rules before you can get into the adventure. So you set up the game depending on the scenario that you're playing. There are several scenarios that can be played as one-shot adventures, but it's much more fun if you play them in order as a campaign. The scenario instructions will tell you uh, which tile you place on the table at the beginning, which one is the starting tile. The scenario instructions will tell you how to set up the stack of dungeon tiles that represent the different locations that the players will discover during the game. When it is your turn, your hero uh, can move and then do another thing, or do another thing and move. That other thing can be to move again, or to attack, to attempt to disarm a trap, or to take a special action. When you end the movement adjacent to an unexplored edge that has an opening, you draw a tile from the stack. Each tile has a triangle, and you place it next to the edge that you're exploring so that the triangle is pointing to that edge and and after that you populate you populate the new tile depending on the symbols that you find there these symbols are traps there are a lot of traps in the game a lot of these tokens <clears throat> which you shuffle and you place there face down and then you can well try to disarm them or uh, to deal with them in other ways. Uh, that symbol there indicates a treasure. Good, but you see there's some stuff that you need to go through to get the treasure. That is a symbol for a monster. So we draw a card from the monster deck and the card tells us the kind of monster that we encounter. For example, we encounter this skeleton guy here. And we place the miniature there, and the card goes in front of the active player. The active player that exploited the edge that caused the monster to be placed on the board. Then, after all is said and done, it is time for the board to do bad stuff, uh, to attack us. Uh, if the player, the active player, did not explore a new edge, or explored an edge and the new tile had a black triangle, then the active player needs to draw an encounter card, and this is all bad stuff. Um, attacks, uh, traps, uh, all sorts of negative effects may occur. You know, simply do what the card says and hope is not, is not too bad. And then the monsters attack you. Um, the active player activates all of the monsters for which she has a card in front of herself. The, the behavior of the monsters is programmed. You simply read the tactics on the card from top to to bottom and do what it what the text says. In most cases, the monsters will try to get closer as close as possible to the heroes and to attack them. There are some monsters, however, that have even tactics. They prefer to attack from a distance. You simply follow the instructions. And then attacks. Well, how you resolve the attacks? The attacks of the monsters against the characters and the heroes against the monsters work exactly in the same way. When a character attacks, you roll a d20 and you attack a, and you add the bonus for that attack. The monsters have that indicated on their card. The heroes, each hero has several uh, cards that can be used to determine an attack. And so the card that you're using to attack will tell you the bonus and also the damage. You roll the die if the result of the d20 plus the bonus of the attack is equal to or higher than the armor class of the enemy, of the target, then you score a hit and you inflict the damage for that attack on the opponent. Most monsters in this game have have one health point, that means a single attack, a single point of damage uh, is enough to take care of them. And these are really the basic ideas <clears throat> of gameplay. Move and attack, attack and move, from time to time perform other actions, um, add new monsters on the board. There is constantly this pressure of moving uh, towards the board and opening new edges so you don't have to draw the encounter cards. But of course, if you overdo that, then you find yourself flooded with monsters, which is not exactly great. 
Now, <clears throat> some more specific things about the implementation of the D&D board game system in this specific set. First, the characters. Let's take a look at the heroes that we have. We have a bard, which, um, let me tell, how can I put it delicately? Is not useless. I mean, bards have this bad reputation of being not particularly useful characters in Dungeons and Dragons, although I find it to be totally fascinating. Uh, but this is a bard that has an interesting ability here. Cat's Agility. When you enter a square containing a trap, you do not trigger the trap on a roll of five or higher. And there will be a lot of traps. Other uh, Dungeons and Dragons board games do not nearly have uh, so many treacherous things on the board. So it can be particularly good. This cat may actually be able to get there, get the treasure and come back without even triggering that trap. It may not be super useful in general, but in this game with just the amount of traps that you have, it is very useful. And also some of the powers are pretty good. There is a power that gives a disadvantage to the enemy. This advantage means that um, whoever has the advantage rolls two dice instead of one and uses the worst result and other conditions will give advantage. So you roll a die twice and you use um, and you use the best result. We have a human ranger that receives two extra daily powers. You know the daily powers are the best powers in the game. So somebody that starts with two extra daily powers, well, that's a good thing. And in fact, this character comes with some extra special unique cards, um, cards that he can use to choose the extra powers. Then we have the, the Sorial Paladin that has Divine Health at the start of your hero phase. Oh, there you go. Because that was at the start of your hero phase, you may end one condition on your hero before it activates. That was the second level. The second level, characters can level up and improve their stats. So it's Pretty good that this hero can get rid of that negative condition. There is a power that I like very much that allows the Carter, uh, when the Carter would use a uh, healing surge, the Carter recovers a health point instead. Very useful. It can prevent you from, from losing the game because healing surges are such an important element in the game. Then we have the human druid that instead of attacking may use the Koopa Lue token and that um, turns into an ally card. I mean, find the Koopa ally card and place it with the rest of the monster cards you control. Koopa Lue activates first in step three of your villain phase. So that is an ally that you can use. Also, he himself can turn into, into various animals, into apes, into panthers, cool stuff. And then we have the wizard that does wizardy stuff, lightning bolts and the like, but also very interesting flying. So when moving, you may spend two move points to move through one tile as though you were a monster. So that is fast movement. Also, a new thing that differentiates this game from previous D&D board games is the fact that you had not just one stack of dungeon tiles, but two, and for at least one of them, dungeon may be a misnomer. As you can see here, this is not a dungeon at all. This is jungle. And actually, most of the scenarios will take place in the jungle, and so we need to have the appropriate terrain. Also, we have a lot of these bland allies here, which are, well, they add some challenge, they make the map more interesting. In some of the early, some of the early games, this almost never happened. You could always go anywhere from, uh, from anywhere. I like this because it gives you more of the sense of amazing, which it is possible to get lost. And so just graphically it's nice to have this new variety and you get the sense that you found some hidden places where there is some good stuff possibly but very often guarded by monsters and or traps. And it's definitely a nice change of uh, background, nice change of setting. At least you, know, it's, you can think of them as well it's like dungeon with a different color in the background and yet, and yet the atmosphere between these very nice styles i find the art to be of very high quality and the thematic monsters and again um a layout in which it was easier to me to get lost than i found i definitely found these tiles not just to be tangent tiles with a different color but to be thematic appropriate and create a different atmosphere but then at some point uh, you may, who knows, enter a, enter a dungeon, maybe even the titular to Bohan Annihilation. Who knows? I don't want to give you too many spoilers. Maybe 
maybe you know this story the overall story from the from the D&D adventure or maybe like myself you didn't know it and you're gonna discover it to the game so I'm not gonna tell you too much but well after traveling a lot in the jungle there is a chance that you will reach some place which is more like your old school dungeon in terms of, of look at least with various types of locations with various types of furniture i'm not showing you everything there are just certain elements that i'm not ready to share for for fear of, for fear of spoiling the experience to you but again, this is the interesting thing. There is more variety in terms of terrain because you're traveling in the jungle for a while and then you are spending some time exploring, well, a dungeon or again, an underground place. I don't think this game is gonna change anybody's mind about uh, the Dungeons and Dragons board games. And I'm happy about that because I like the previous, the previous games, so I didn't wanna change my mind. I wanna keep thinking it was a good system and I really enjoyed this one. If you enjoyed the previous games, chances are that you are gonna find this one as compelling as the previous ones, if not more. If you didn't like the previous games, if you found them too easy, I don't know, for, too easy or too simple. For some people it is like, yeah, move, roll a die, move, roll a die, get a sword, get a card with a sword, that kind of stuff. Some people find it too bland, um, too basic, um, and I don't. Frankly, they don't because I enjoy them. I find that the system is, yes, very simple, very linear, uh, but around that very linear system, then the components, the characters, uh, the flavor text in this scenario, the adventures in scenario book, the adventures, the way the adventures are connected in a campaign. To me, all of those things bring a lot of flavor, a lot of theme. Um, I like then the fact that the basic engine is very simple because it allows the theme to shine through the to shine through the uh, through the mechanics. Again, there are games that have more of mechanical realism, like war games in which the way things work uh, reflects the way things work historically, but those are usually very complex also. Here, it's not about history, so if it's a little inaccurate, what does that even mean? Um, if it's a little bit abstract, the way warriors attack or the way wizards cast spells, oh, that's not the way a spell is cast. So to me, basic, simple, linear mechanics work in a fantasy, um, in a fantasy universe, and in a game experience that is so much about the theme, so much about the characters, so much about the story. So that's what I liked in the previous games. This is what I like here, and this is what you will not like if you didn't like that in the previous games. The components, uh, some people have been complaining since the times of Castle and Raven Love um, about the components, about the fact that the monster cards are in black and white, that the encounter cards only have text, so they don't have illustrations, and since the times of Castle and Raven Love, I've been saying that I like it, I like these components, I don't have anything uh, against them. The miniatures are beautiful, the tiles are are very evocative and the cards the encounter cards do not have illustrations but guess what they have they have text and if i'm playing a role-playing game most likely those encounters would be described to me by the dungeon master verbally uh, there's not going to be a probably a, a powerpoint presentation about each new encounter each new event. So I see those texts that do not have images as just the narration that is given to me by the Dungeon Master that here has been programmed into the cards and then I place the image and I create the image in my mind and, and, and that is that and it works for me. As for the cards of the monsters, they are black and white, yes they, they are, but then I have the real thing, I have a three-dimensional detailed miniature right in front of me and to me that is enough to create a connection with the magic world of the story I do not need the card if anything maybe I don't know, it would be distracting there is no need for that and if that at the end they save a little bit of ink and made the game cost 25 cents less I know that's 25 cents I didn't spend in color illustrations that I haven't found necessary in previous in previous installments and I did not miss here so component wise again uh, I like them some people don't um, and again, that's, that's what you can expect. You can expect I mean, more of the same. Now, this could be the only caveat if you did like the previous ones, um, but maybe you're starting to get tired. Is this uh, 
while very similar to the previous ones, different enough. In my opinion it is, I didn't find it was a repeat of Legend of Dress. Uh, to me, especially starting from Legend of Dress, uh, the terrain of the, of the games in the series, with Legend of Dress, Temple of Mental Evil, and now Tomb Annihilation, has become more and more interesting, with special areas that will create different effects, uh, there are timing elements, etc, etc. Here you have two types of terrain, you have just a configuration of um, of paths that seems more interesting than before. You have a lot of traps and that causes its own different set of problems. So that makes the terrain different in a, in a different way. So um, I found uh, the challenges, the stories, the monsters different enough, different enough that I didn't feel um, that it was a repeat. So if you enjoyed the previous games and you're in this like paradoxical position when you like a series you want more of the same and yet you want something different to me Tomb of Annihilation manages to get in that little Goldilocks band in that very narrow uh, band in which you find that that balance all the things that I liked in the previous games plus new monsters new stuff that still I was excited to discover and um, that it was fun to play with some of the scenarios work very differently from traditional scenarios you remember that big juggernaut that I showed you? That is one hack of a scenario to play. I'm not gonna give you too many details, but it works differently from most other scenarios in this set and in the previous sets. Uh, one thing that I think could have been done better, uh, there are no female characters, no playable female characters, no playable female heroes. Now, maybe some of those anthropomorphic characters are female characters, so I don't know, I can't tell a female eagle from a male one, especially if it's a female humanoid eagle from a male one. Uh, to me, they seemed male, but that could be just the assumption that when I don't know the default mental position of our culture is like, well, they're for male. Um, it's, I think it's a missed opportunity. It's, uh, our society is changing, the world of our wonderful hobby is changing and I really appreciate companies that are acknowledging that change and also helping that change moving further. Uh, I believe it's important that women are represented in games and I just don't have the sense that this allows me to do so. Again, those, uh, the tiger, the, 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 the humanoid eagle, they're gender neutral, I can imagine them as female. Again, maybe they are in the original set, I don't know. But the fact that you clearly have a uh, human man and you do not have human or humanoid uh, women, to me that's that's a limitation, that's a missed opportunity, I wish it had been done differently. But again, you know, at least if you have the previous sets, you can mix and match carters and you can use some of those carters there, but I would have liked to have some new uh, playable female characters here. All in all, this being aside, this is a very good set, a very new chapter in the D&D &D board game, uh, D &D board games family, Tomb of Annihilation. All the, all the old stuff is here. Uh, and everything, however, has been combined with new thematic elements that, in my opinion, work. It was it was fun for me to, to, to see the story develop, to play the scenarios, to see the characters grow and the challenges grow. It did exactly what the other uh, games in the system did for me, which is to provide me with several hours of good fun and good fantasy adventuring. And to me, that is a, that's a pretty good thing.